Liverpool, the Labour Mayor of North of Tyne. Uh, Jackie Doyle-Price is Conservative MP for Thurrock and a former Health Minister. Naomi Smith is Chief Executive of the internationalist campaign group Best for Britain. And we have the political YouTuber Maya Tusi with us as well. Let me remind you, you can watch us on Global Player as well. Three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. Tweet at LBC. Text eight four eight five zero. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. Let's go to our first question. It's Chris in Richmond. Hello, Chris. Good evening, Ian, and good evening, panel. Should Christian Wayford force a by-election now that he's decided to defect the Labour Party? What do you think? I think he should. Because otherwise you'd be, you'd be accused of being a hypocrite. And also, what's, what have Labour got to lose? They're 10 points plus ahead in the opinion polls. It's not going to change a government, but it would also show how firm you know, Labour support is. And it would show they're not running scared. OK, uh, Jamie Driscoll, the Labour Party seems to be a, a bit split on this, in that some people say it's outrageous, he's, he's not, he doesn't believe in the values of the Labour Party, and he shouldn't be allowed in. We heard from Labour, from Young Labour just a moment ago, Momentum have said the same thing. And I saw my colleague Jackie Smith tweeting earlier, well, of course, we've got to win, win Conservatives over if we're going to win an election, so of course we should welcome him. What's your view? I think we should have a by-election. I think anyone who switches, we should have a by-election. Douglas Carswell did it when he went from the Tories to UKIP. Um, but I actually think it's in Labour's interest to have a by-election, as Chris just said, because we'd smash it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously the Prime Minister and Prime Minister's questions came back with that quip, you know, we'll win it back at the next general election. Let's call it a general election and find out, because we'll probably find that he doesn't have a mandate to govern anymore were it to go to a general election. In terms of a by-election, though, it, the problem that Labour would have there, and I, I agree with you, I think they'd probably win it, but the taxpayer would think, well, hang on a minute, he, he was already a Labour MP, you've wasted £100,000 of taxpayers' money or whatever um, telling us what we already knew. I think uh, you don't put a price on democracy. I think that the taxpayers would understand in this situation what was going on. If someone wants to defect... You know, I think in politics, you've got to allow that people can change their minds. Otherwise, kind of, what's the point of debate? Um, but in the case of someone who's been a Tory MP, voting for all the things that the, the, the new Labour, uh, the um, young Labour person was saying earlier, then I think, um, you know, it would be quite an interesting CLP meeting when he goes along to his constituency Labour Party for the first <laughs> time. Um, that is going to be interesting. Um, I know what it's like on the ground. You know, there's, there's um, Tory MPs in the North East who become new Tory MPs. Um, and the sort of the Twitter battles they get into with local councillors and things like that. There's going to have to be a lot of bridges built because, you know, if you're allowing that people can change their mind, you also allow that that requires building bridges. The, the combined authority I run is cross-party. I've got Tories in my cabinet because that's the legal framework of governance that we use. Um, and you have to be able to get on with people. And uh, so that's the challenge that Christian Wakeford has to, has to step up to. Well, if anyone listening to this programme is on Bury South C, uh, Constituency Labour Party Executive, uh, we would love you to press record on your phone and record that meeting. I think it would be highly entertaining. <laughs> now, Jackie Doyle-Price, I cannot imagine the circumstances that you could possibly ever defect from the Conservative Party, but if you did, would you regard it as incumbent on yourself to, to face a by-election? Um, actually, I probably wouldn't. Um, you're absolutely right, and there are no circumstances. You know, this party is my party, and I shall fight to, when you know if, if it adopts policies I don't like. I'd fight against them from within. But, but I think that's that's exactly the point, isn't it? I mean, if part and parcel of participating in the political process is that you know when things change, you you know you have to show a position of leadership and and give challenge if if you're not happy. That's you know we take our our position as MPs, we are directly elected by our constituents. More often than not, we are reflecting uh, their views. And to be brutally frank, I don't think the public thanks any politician for a by-election. I've, I've not seen enough doors in, uh, during by-elections to know that they never really want them. You know, so the, the, the view of Brenda from Bristol is even more stark when it comes to, <laughs> to by-elections. So, so it's not something that I would do. I would, I would view myself as having a mandate by virtue of being elected by the people of Thurrock. Now, fair, fair dues, they would have elected me as a Conservative. But, you know, if, if, if I was so minded to leave the Conservative Party, something would be very seriously wrong and I would need to use my seat in Parliament to fight that. You are my litmus test for that. Um, <laughs> Naomi Smith. 
I think it's a great question, Chris, to kick us off this evening. Um, and it's one that, that lots of people have been asking. It's the system that we've got. You know, Jackie's right. We've, we've, this is our form of parliamentary democracy that we've got in the UK at the moment. And I would love to talk about all of the ways that system needs to be reformed and improved and made much more democratic than the process that we've got at the moment. But that's a that's a, probably another question for another time, getting into the nuts and bolts of changing the voting system. Um, I think given given the, the, the level that is going to be given to him of... Um, the, the argument levied at him that he's going to be a hypocrite for not doing what he has called others to do, I think is going to be a, a, a big challenge for him. Uh, you're right, the polls are looking very good for Labour in that seat. There's been lots of Conservative MPs out today saying, well, you know, what, what um, people need to remember is that it was Boris Johnson that won those red wall seats. It was Boris Johnson uh, that, that helped to win that seat of Bury South from um, Labour. I would argue that actually Jeremy Corbyn had quite a lot to do with um, actually Conservatives winning winning some of those seats from Labour at the last election. I campaigned in quite a few Red Bull seats um, and certainly what I was hearing on the doorsteps there from people that had voted Labour uh, lifelong that they couldn't this time because of Jeremy Corbyn. So um, mm. uh, we are likely going to face an election within the next couple of years, potentially sooner if we change the Conservative leader. So I guess we'll find out what the people of Bury South think then. Um, but I, I would be advising um, him myself to go for a, a by-election just because of the levels of hypocrisy that it screams for not doing so. Maya Tusi. I mean, in terms of the actual question, uh, unless you get Anna Subri or maybe st stop Brexit, Steve Bray, everyone's in favour of the by-election anyway, uh, any, any same person. But in terms of um, what Jamie said, I don't think it's a guarantee that it's going to be a Labour landslide, even with uh, the new Tory defector. I think um, because of the the way the Labour Party have uh, been reacting to it. Some of the members have been reacting to him, defecting, saying he's not you know, a true socialist, and also the Tory side basically completely destroying him. And it's a bit of a complicated situation. It's good to see, even by-election-wise, to see the mood in Bury South. Uh, but as you know, the, the others said, uh, the best way to find out if Bury South is red or blue is a general election, really. Um, and also, I'm, I'm quite interested to see that... Um, kind of executive meeting uh, with the local Labour Party. If we had uh, the, another Jackie, Jackie Weaver, actually been uh, in charge of that Zoom meeting, <laughs> it would be good to see how that goes. <laughs> well, she, her services might be required, I think. Uh, uh, <laughs> that. Let's bring in a text question on a similar theme from Laura in Durham, who says, what does Christian Wakeford's defection as a Member of Parliament representing a Northern seat say about the government's levelling up agenda? Now, in his letter, Jackie, I don't know if, if you've read it, but he was accusing the government of totally failing on the level up agenda, particularly in Bury South. But we're going to play out an interview I did a little earlier after nine mm -hmm. o'clock with the leader of the Conservative group on Bury, on Bury Council, who was able to point to a, a new high school, £20 million invested in a new shopping centre. It's, you don't know who to believe on these things, do you? Jackie. Sorry, sorry, I thought we were going. You, you were saying something. Um, well, it's it's interesting because I I remember I was I was driving home last week when you were interviewing Christian Wakeford um, uh, about whether he'd put a letter in or not, and and I, I was listening to that interview and I was thinking, yeah, there was somebody who was clearly very conflicted. Um, I, I think I think there is. <laughs> There's lots of things that lead up to someone well, he, making he, he, that. He was, he was certainly conflicted about whether he had sent a letter in to, telling us on air, which he didn't tell us on air, but he did. Five seconds after he came off air, he walked out of the studio and said, yes, I have sent one in. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, 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 say, I, I felt very uncomfortable listening uh, to that interview. And I've, and I've also felt very uncomfortable hearing the reaction of Conservative members and of Labour members as well, because... You know, I do think that clearly he, he's put himself in a very difficult position. He's very conflicted politically. I think there is a lot about the levelling up agenda that the government's pursuing, which has actually gone by the wayside because of COVID. And, and also because of the fact we're spending an awful lot of time dealing with things like party gates and things that are an incredible distraction. And, and if somebody is, you know, wanting to make a difference for their constituents and is getting frustrated, then it can, you know, lead them in a particular direction. Um, okay. But, you know, I, I, I wish him well, and uh, I, you know, I, I hope that he's happy with the decision that he's made. 
Uh, that's very charitable. You're much more charitable than most of your colleagues have been today, it has to be said, Jackie. But that is, that is you, we know that. Uh, Jamie, um, levelling up agenda, you, you're uh, obviously in the, in the North East. Do you see any evidence of it working? Uh, not only in the North East, in the front line of this is a Metro Mayor delivering it. Yeah, um, the, There's a number of things that the government promised that haven't happened. Um, so there was promised there was going to be a, a levelling up and devolution white paper within the first year. Now, you can understand that being put back by some months because of COVID. But we're, we're over two years and it still hasn't happened. Um, and the date keeps changing. The, the promise, the integrated rail plan, that Northern Penthouse Rail, and this was a manifesto commitment, would be delivered. That's been reneged upon. So it, the, the really, it hasn't happened in a significant way. What has happened is individual small funds that local areas can bid into. And I think everybody, and I'm not going to name who, but I, I talked to quite a number of, of Tory ministers and SPADs and think tanks, obviously, as part of my, my job is to do the best for my area rather than necessarily uh, engage in, in party battles. I'm not an MP. Um, and, and they all acknowledge that this is a pretty inefficient system. So you've got this £4.2 billion fund, which is for the whole country, and you bid in for individual projects. But you spend all this time bidding in for projects. You don't know if you're going to get money. You don't know when your current funding is going to run out. You can't operate strategically. It's just a bad form of governance. And at the heart of this is a conflict between number 10 and number 11. So the integrated rail plan was underfunded because spent all the money on um, HS2, basically from Birmingham to London, and the Chancellor refused to give any more. I'm told the reason the levelling up white paper is delayed is because Michael Gove and team are arguing with Treasury to try and get some money so they've actually got, got some money to spend rather than just announcing, you know, changes in the deck chairs. So um, they haven't delivered. They absolutely need to deliver. Um, and local mayors, cross-party, we're all agreed on this. You know, Transport for the North, cross-party, it was unanimous that we want Northern Powerhouse Rail delivered. So everybody who's representing anybody in the North says that this hasn't happened and it needs to happen. OK, well, we'll have more from our panel in just a moment. 0345 6060 973. It's called... Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 18 minutes past eight. With me on Cross Question, Jamie Driscoll, Labour Mayor of North of Tyne, Jackie Doyle Price, a Conservative MP for Thurrock, Naomi Smith from Best for Britain, and the political YouTuber Maya Tusi. Let's go to our next caller. It is uh, Clive in Miami in Florida. Hello, Clive. Hi, Ian. Question Hi. is Is it disingenuous for the Prime Minister to point the success of the vaccine rollout as the single biggest index of trust in this government. Um, Jackie Doyle Price, you were a health minister um, through the first part of the pandemic, I, I think. Um, how do you respond to Clive's question? Well, I, I think if I was in Miami, uh, I wouldn't be uh, <laughs> worrying about watching watching all this. But uh, I mean, let's be let's be frank. You know, the, the government did make substantial investments and took a gamble. It was a big gamble in uh, investing in in the vaccine, and it's a gamble that has paid off. Um, but I wouldn't describe it as an issue of trust. I think, I think you know, this government has made decisions in good faith and the best possible ones it could on based on the information at the time. And we're now in a good place on the back of that. Um, ultimately, good performance, though, is not the same as good behaviour. And, you know, we still expect our ministers to be to show evidence of good behaviour as well. And do you think the Prime Minister's done that? Uh, <laughs> To be fair, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to not, I'm not going to uh, try and, and, and dodge this. That yeah, the truth is, the jury's out, isn't it? Uh, and and that's why we will all wait Sue Gray's report with with uh, some uh, anticipation. And uh, you know, I'm not telling tales out of school, Ian, when I say to you that you know, talking the tea rooms is a little else. And if you were foreman of the jury, which how would you be leading the other members of the jury? <laughs> Well, I'd still be out under consideration at the moment. I, I mean, we're talking about... Uh, I've not seen enough evidence to come to a clear view yet, so I'm still, I'm still sitting in that courtroom. So you are one of the MPs that is literally waiting agog for Sue Gray's report, and you will make your judgment after that? Well, I, I, I'd go a bit further than that, actually, Ian. I, you know... I mean, let's let's be frank. It's 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 not a secret that I didn't vote for Boris Johnson to be leader of the Conservative Party, and the reason I didn't is because I knew he had a cavalier approach to rules. 
uh, and, and that's not something I want to see. However, you know, the party's made its choice and I'm very much the kind of person where, you know, the king is dead along with the king. And, and you know, while ever he's my leader, I, I will, will give him uh, my support as, as far as I'm able to. But um, is part of your judgment based on whether you still see him as an, ele- as an election winner? Because there is no doubt that there are many people, particularly in the Midlands and the North, who voted Conservative in 2019 because of him. They didn't vote Conservative. They voted for, and I'm sure Jamie would agree with this, they voted for Boris Johnson. Now, if you and your colleagues come to the conclusion that well they're not going to next time that, and you think one of the other one of your other senior colleagues might be in a better place well that that, that surely has also got to inform your decision no i, th- I think for me it's very much standards of behavior and and, I'm, and I'm, i will be very clear i want to see change by this prime minister to be brutally frank with you and that's one of the reasons the jury's out you know i, I want to see him show more humility um, I want to see him have better respect for process. Uh, I think the culture of what we've seen in Number 10 is not acceptable. And and I what I will be interested in seeing is not so much what Sue Gray concludes, but how he acts on the basis of, of those conclusions. And, and, and I want to see a Conservative Prime Minister that's leading a party that knows how to behave, um, basically. And... You know, we've. I, I mean, we can go back. There have been a number of occasions that I think we've, if we go back to the vote on Owen Paterson, for example, I think that's that's really an example. Of, that's something I don't want to see a Conservative government doing, is is trying to change rules and trying to choose change standards to support itself. And you know, for as long as I'm happy that we're doing the right thing, um, you know, Boris Johnson will get my support. But if if I become very settled in the view that we're doing the wrong thing, then that would be a different matter. Well, I don't know about you, but you, you and I and Boris Johnson are not dissimilar ages. I think he's probably a bit, he's certainly a bit younger than, than me. Um, I, I'm basically too old to change my ways. I don't know whether you, you are too old to change your ways, but I, we're not going to get a different Boris Johnson, are we? Are we realistically? Um, we can get a different machine. Uh, and, you know, as I say, we've got a culture at number 10 uh, that, that has been willfully, you know, it, well, it's, I suppose the culture is set by the person at the top, but he's got to realise that he is responsible for the ministerial code. It does apply to him, and I want to okay. see some clear action that he has actually taken these lessons on board. Right. Um, I hope the other three on the panel understand that I spent a bit longer with Jackie on this one that I'm intending to spend with, with all of you. But um, my two C, you, you are seen as somebody on the right. You, I don't think you are a sort of paid up member of the Conservative Party, but you are, you are seen as a right of centre commentator. What's your verdict on Clive's question? I just in regards to just the, the, the cabinet or... Oh, no, whether, whether you think it's disingenuous to point the vaccine rollout as the single saving grace of the government that should be deserving of the public's trust. Uh, it, is, it is a good point because um, th- there's a lot of other things that, for example, the cabinet and the government, generally speaking, could boast about and we could praise them. And as you said, actually, about half an hour ago before this show started, you, you were talking about how we always have to be objective. And that's I always try my best to be objective when Boris or the cabinet does something, do something good, praise them when it doesn't. You know, criticize and actually try to be objective. And I think there's a lot of things that the, the government have done okay. And there's a lot of, I think the disappointments um, are too visible, whether it's the border control uh, or uh, the leveling of the agenda. I know that actually I agree that the pandemic stuff didn't really help, but uh, it's too much rhetoric and less action. Uh, but with this, I think it's, it's kind of it's a big gamble when if, if a government or the leader come out and say, well, this is basically the only big thing. And uh, it, it, it will always backfire. I think there's a lot of things that because some people on the left would come out and say, well, it's, you can't take too much credit for this. There's other people involved. And it, it, in that case, everything that happens, any policy, there's always other groups that do it, whether it's civil servants or you know, the health experts or whatever. Uh, and a, a good leader, a smart leader, takes credit the right way without common causes too much me, me, me. And also mm. uh, delegate the right way. Boris was, uh, to be fair, I backed Boris um, because um, at the time, because it was, I, I thought that he was good at delegating and he was he was doing that as, as mayor of London. But I, I don't have faith in the team, the people around him. What happened to this delegation that you know, being a smart manager is not good with details. I get it. And it's not a perfect character. <laughs> it's, uh, and as Jackie says, you know, I, I agree with her absolutely. And I understand why she didn't back him at the time. Uh, but I had faith that he would be a good delegator and he would actually understand to get the right people involved to make sure that, you know, everything else goes smoothly. Jamie Driscoll, what's your answer to Clive? 
It's interesting. My art, I think, raises a key point there. Any politician in charge, you don't do all the work yourself. Everybody who knows anything understands that. Um, and it is about the points at which you intervene and make the decisions and the strategy is set. So the decision to buy a load of vaccines was a good decision. You would expect any government to get more decisions right than they get wrong. You know, you've got a whole team of advisors around you. you know, it takes takes some going to get everything wrong. Um, but I think the, the big mistake that the government made in the handling of the vaccine came down to how they communicated, how they drew in other partners. So if you look at something like the vaccine rollout, um, essentially, you know, scientists are cracking on with it and, and there's nothing really you can do as a government in the short term. You've either got a load of educated, skilled people in this workforce or you haven't. So they develop it and the government buys it. Um, and then the rollout was the result of good work by NHS organisers, um, doctors, nurses, loads of volunteers. I mean, my wife's a GP. They, they were all volunteering at the weekend. So there's this huge outpouring of public goodwill that mm. got, partly got us there. If you compare that with the test and trace system, which is a very complicated system that involves you passing information around, mm. then that was disastrous. And we got to the point where senior civil servants were investigating this and saying it was the biggest waste of money ever, running into billions, because central government just basically didn't tell us what was going on um, at time after time. Um, and so the, the, the strategic decision and management that's perhaps down to the politicians at the top, I don't think they did a particularly good job at, um, yet despite the fact that the vaccine rollout was good, um, and you know everybody involved in that deserves credit. Yeah. Naomi Smith. I mean, I absolutely agree on the point that Jamie just made about the, the volume of people that were involved in that vaccine rollout delivery and the NHS, of course, uh, deserves huge credit for it as well. And I think on the issue of trust and high Clive in Miami, I will gladly swap places with you because it is plummeting temperatures here. So please do make the most of <laughs> having a far, far, far nicer winter than we're having. Um, on the trust issue, they the, the government has broken trust on a lot of fronts, whether it is that levelling up agenda, um, really failing uh, parts of Yorkshire and the North East, around uh, you know the, the the northern powerhouse and the and the infrastructure that they were promised whether it's about you know universal credit uplift being scaled back and and the cost of living that is really now beginning uh, to bite whether it is things like dodgy ppe contracts and of course the, the the wasted billions on the the failed test and trace program but on on vaccines specifically yes of course we did very well but for those of us who are worried about future lockdowns, who are worried about having to have any reimposition of restrictions because of a new variant that may come along, what this government needs to do and do very, very quickly is to be world leading rather than world beating when it comes to vaccine internationalism. At the moment, those in the lowest income countries, fewer than 5% of them are fully vaccinated. Only 10% of them have received one vaccine. And we've seen these new variants tending to come forward in areas of very, very low uh, vaccine rollout. So what the government really needs to do is to... Uh, <laughs> of course, um, start to rebuild trust with people. And one way they can do that is to deliver on their G7 commitment, which is 100 million doses delivered by June this year. I think at the current uh, figure, it's only about 30 million doses. And with a lower booster uptake in the UK than was anticipated, we've actually got even more excess vaccine supplies um, than we thought we had. So I think this government really needs to get on with that to keep us all safe. Um, Jackie Doyle Price, you have a new fan. It's Brian in Dulwich. He says, This conservative lady is giving me some faith that there are still some good members about. I've, I've heard a lot of guff recently. Can we say guff? I think we can. Um, I like the cut of her jib. Enough about Jackie's jib there. 0345 6060 973. That's the number to call to speak to Jackie, Jamie, Maya, and Naomi over the next half an hour. It's half past eight on LBC. Lots Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 8.34 on LBC. Uh, Jamie Driscoll is with us. Jackie Doyle Price, Naomi Smith, and Maya Tusi. We have lots of calls to go to, so let's go to Dean in Abingdon. Hello, Dean. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Um, Hi. I'd like to ask um, what the panel think about uh, clinically vulnerable people, me being one of them. Um, we've had no instructions from the government. Of that the, the evidence is going to be dropped. Um, my fear of going out would be that 
people will not um, give me space, which I would need, uh, therefore I'm going to be trapped again. Well, to be, to be fair, they only announced it this afternoon, so I don't know whether yeah. there is going to be any formal communication or whether they just expect everyone to uh, well, get it through the media. Me a letter, Ian. Yeah, well, you, you might get one in the next few yeah, days. Um, all, I, all I say is that I wear a mask um, and um, I keep my distance as much as I can, but people just yeah. walk all over you, you know. OK, let's go to our panel. Uh, Naomi Smith, um, do, does Dean have calls for concern? I mean, at the moment, I think that the current um, data is saying that within the first two weeks of January, about one in 20 people in England and I think one in 25 people in Wales had the virus. So still very, very high levels. Um, and I think that while um, we are scaling back on, on the restrictions, I mean, I personally am going to continue to wear a mask in crowded spaces. I'm going to try and have ventilated rooms where possible in the office because that, that you know, that, that just makes sense. Um, I really do hope that you get some good guidance quickly. Um, and, you know, I, I do feel very, very sorry for those who are asked to uh, enforce uh, mask wearing when it really isn't their job to do that um, and and you know it has been a, a real pressure on retailers and uh, transport workers who you know would presumably for their own health really quite like all of their passengers and customers um, to be wearing masks and keeping safe distances um, but you know with what power can they really enforce that and, and certainly um, the police have, have said themselves that you know it's not really something they've wanted to enforce so it has been very very difficult but you would hope that the decency of a fellow human being would 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 give people um, some space while case rates are still so incredibly high. And I, I, I wish you all the very best. And I'm very sorry to hear about your situation. And I do hope that um, everybody who's clinically vulnerable gets some really clear guidance very soon. And do you think that this phrase returning to normality normality is going to be when you and I don't want to wear masks, well in fact we probably don't want to wear masks now but we do it's when we when we don't wear masks in future mm. and when people like Dean can feel safe to go out without any restrictions, that, that's got to be surely what we've all got to aim for Absolutely and that's you know why I, I was talking about the vaccine internationalism point um, earlier before the break uh, we are at risk of, of new variants emerging and of then having to have uh, a reimposition of restrictions and potential lockdowns if we uh, do face that. So the best thing that the government can do and advanced economy governments around the world can do is to make sure that those lower income countries all get access to the vaccines that we've all been so privileged to be able to get access to. Jamie Driscoll. I think Dean's really representative of, of a lot of people's concerns on this. Um, the there are also, we've got to take into account those who are working in public facing situations as well. Um, you know, we, we want to operate with as few restrictions as we can. But if you're in a public facing job and you're very close to people, you are going to be nervous a little bit. You know, there's still loads of people off work because of um, having COVID, being pinged with COVID and other things like that. Um, and there's still, one of the things actually I think I would very much like the government to focus on much more strongly is there's still like that, that section of people who are vulnerable either because of their age, um, mostly, or, or in some cases because of the medical conditions, who haven't been triple vaccinated. Um, and I don't think we should be waiting for that to just take effect. I would like to see uh, significant investment in making sure those people are kept as safe as possible as a result of having all three jabs at the right stage frequency. So I think that's what we want to get to as soon as we can. Maya. I mean, it's a very good point, actually, in terms of, firstly, this announcement, uh, whether we should expect more details, because usually you get more details in terms of uh, the communication, either from the Prime Minister on TV or something, or in the press. Uh, there might just be just be like, this is it. We just withdrew the, the restrictions. I hope, I hope not, firstly, for that reason. Secondly, in terms of... The, that going back to normal, there is this kind of category of, uh, while the majority of people are safe from the virus, generally speaking, the majority, you still have the clinically vulnerable and the elderly. And people f f forget about that part because, you know, people pe pe think about ourselves, you know, the young and healthy, we're like, well, yeah, we go back to normal now. You know, you got the jab, you're, you know, you're fine now, or you got immunity, whatever they say. But then actually there is this part that I think the government's job should be to now, in the, in the new normal or going back to normal, to find an efficient way to communicate 
directly or semi-directly with the clinic and vulnerable, with the elderly as well. Um, so they could say, fine, if you're young and healthy, you got your jabs or whatever, you're fine. We're not going to come after you anymore. But still communicate because there are a lot of people like in you know, a lot of callers that you guys get that, you know, they're still obviously afraid that, that, you know, something could happen if they go outside and then they're walking like near a shop and then there's a big crowd and they get stuck in there. And then, you know, you never know something could happen. And that's, you know, that's the feeling that people have. So and so they, there has to be some sort of mechanism for the government to now directly communicate on a regular basis to make sure that they are kind of up to date with it the way they you kind know, of people should kind of behave and the, the way they can actually get support as well from the government. Maya, do you think that the government should also be communicating to those young, healthy, triple vaccinated people like yourself that they've got a duty to continue wearing a mask while cases are so high? Because it's not so much about protecting yourself as about protecting people like Dean, right. um, who who are obviously much more vulnerable than you are. I do understand the point. I fully understand that the, the only issue is do we have a deadline? Do we have any boundary? Because uh, are we going to keep doing this for you know, five years, 10 years or forever? Is, is there a point where we're like, OK, we've now done the study, the virus is now fine? Because um, I, I do get why we could do that. Uh, then uh, communicate with everybody else to also be responsible when they go to Tesco or whatever. Uh, but in reality, it, it will make things difficult. I mean, there is there is this tension in, within society. And I'm not just talking about, you know, oh, there's a small chunk of anti-vaxxers protesting. Not that. There is, a, there is a tension where people just don't like restrictions, too much restriction for too long, um, because they think it's just for the sake of it. Um, unless, you know, you find a new way to kind of uh, convince people and explain to people that, well, we're going to have to have uh, the, the daily kind of uh, at least culturally restrictions. Like in, in in China, people walk around with face masks all the time anyway. Uh, unless unless that happens in Europe and in in the West in general, it is quite difficult to do that. And and that, as Jamie said, that one of the problems we had with test and trace was that you, it's not just the government or bureaucrats. You also have to rely on people to actually use the test and trace system properly. And when they don't obviously communicate it, the whole system kind of fails. Um, but that's kind of the reality, I guess. That's the problem. Well, my, you were very kind earlier. You, you, you told your Twitter followers that you were coming on cross-question, and one of them has responded, Martin Lee. He says, I'm not sure I could keep a civil tongue in my head if I had to see Ian Dale. The side he's chosen is very clear, and it's not mine. I should be looking at your response to that tweet a little later. <laughs> um, <laughs> former Health Minister Jackie Doyle-Price, what's your answer to Dean's question? I, I have to say, I'm not surprised to hear that kind of anxiety, and it's one of the challenges in health is actually creating creating a message that is effective and really captures everybody's risk from those who you know have no concerns about the virus and those who are understandably very anxious about it and you know it's, it's actually very difficult to, to get to the right place in that but if we are trying to get back to normal I think part of the messaging is you know go go out there let's we've got to live with this disease we've got to make the most of it but but equally, to reassure people like Dean, there are messages we need to give to healthy people, people like Maya, and say, look, you know, do be considerate about other people. There are still lots of anxious people. There's still good reasons to respect hands, face, space, and, you know, messages uh, like that. Because notwithstanding that people are vaccinated and less vulnerable uh, to this disease, it's still pretty nasty. Um, and I, I mean, I've got a colleague of mine who's who's contracted it and and is in a is in a terrible state actually, and she and she has uh, face abscesses and things. So it's still a pretty unpleasant disease, but but it's actually getting to the right position where we're driving behaviour that respects the risks of it, but still gets us back to normal because we can't actually stay at home forever. OK, we will come back to your questions in just a moment. 0345 6060 973. It's coming up to 8.45. LBC. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. Yeah, all great. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 8.47, Jamie Driscoll, Jackie Doyle-Price, Naomi Smith and Maya Tusi with us answering your calls. Uh, but this is a text from Alice in Manchester saying the situation in Ukraine is only getting worse and it seems to be getting lost in the noise of UK politics. Do you think that Boris should just get it over with and leave so that we can start focusing on the more important stuff? Um, Naomi. Yes, I think he um, is now putting us in a position where 
we are losing authority and credibility. Um, one of two things happened. You know, he has either lied about going to a party or he was too stupid to realise he was at a party. And neither of those, I think, are, are, are characteristics we need in a prime minister right now, given the multiple threats that we're facing uh, on, on many different fronts. Um, he has lost the authority um, to implement not just COVID rules, but, but any of our laws, frankly. Um, he's losing the support of his backbenchers. He is losing the support of his voters. Uh, he has lost an MP today, of course, as well. Um, and uh, and we are losing our soft power globally um, as well. The the New York Times front page of its international edition last week was talking oh, about. Come, the you're not of, going to quote the New York Times, are you? They are so anti-Britain. But, but, but it's it's think just it, a I joke. Think it, it's not just the New York Times. I mean, look at his last press conference <laughs> at COP26, Ian. He had to stand up in front of the world's attention and other global leaders to categorically state that the UK was not a corrupt country. Um, and I mean, I, I, I'm sort of, I you know as a patriot that embarrasses me deeply that, that we've now got a leader who, the, you know, isn't commanding the respect internationally that he should and, and the soft power erosion uh, that, that has come with his uh, leadership of our country is real. And at the moment we need to be aligning very closely um, as a Western alliance. Uh, of course, it's not just uh, the Johnson regime that has eroded Western influence. It's also, of course, the Trump years of the USA, but never has uh, the, the, the Western alliance been weaker. Um, Brexit, of course, has meant that the EU isn't as strong as it once was. And Trump's impact on the USA and then, you know, the, the withdrawal of both the UK and the US from Afghanistan. And who has been there waiting in the wings to seize on all of this. Who wanted Brexit and Trump more than any, more than Putin did? Very, very few people. And so he is, of course, exploiting the situation that the West finds itself in, distracted by other issues. Um, and uh, and he, he, he so often is talking about this in terms of NATO, and in terms of oh, I can't have I can't have NATO forces on my borders. But actually, when you look at history, when you look at the invasion in 2014 uh, of, of, of Russia into, into Crimea, then that was off the back of the people of the Ukraine saying that they actually wanted to join uh, and have closer ties to Western Europe than it did the central uh, uh, Asian and, and, and Russian sphere of influence, customs union and things like that. So it was actually a direct uh, response, I think, to um, him being very concerned about the sovereign uh, nation that was Ukraine wanting to forge closer links with Western Europe than with Russia. Well, that, that's the key there, isn't it? Ukraine is a sovereign nation and it can decide its own future, or that ought to be the case, I would have thought. Um, Maya Tusi. I mean, firstly, when it comes to Ukraine um, and also just the, our foreign policy, luckily we have a system where, and at least it used to be like that, but the, the, the establishment, the foreign, the foreign office in general and defence MOD uh, was strong enough to, um, regardless of who the leader is or if there's a problem with the leader, uh, then they can still have plans in place in terms of rhetoric, at least, in dealing with these sort of things diplomacy-wise. Uh, but also, let's not forget that the, 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 we're no longer that empire that we used to be. America is the main player, and it's the fact that Joe Biden's leadership is so undermined that Putin now is brave enough to, even as a bluff, uh, you know, even if it was a bluff, to actually even say these sort of things, of like, well, we're going to go to Ukraine. Uh, so whether we like it or not, I know we still are a major player, uh, we kind of have to follow America. So Americans need to sort out their problems first. But I still also agree that, yes, we need solid leadership. And right now, Downing Street needs to sort out their problems because um, if we want to have even soft power, uh, we can't continue like this when we, inside the country, we're talking about gossip politics in Westminster. And uh, then also around the country, there are people who are concerned about various issues. But also internationally, uh, we, you know, we, we used to be respected. And I, I still believe that we are respected but I, I want to make sure that you know we go back to being that uh, the strong soft powers so that we could actually influence, okay. uh, and not just follow America. Uh, Jamie Driscoll, President Zelensky of Ukraine, said this evening apparently that he's expecting an invasion from Russia by the weekend. I mean that would be catastrophic. But I mean there's nothing that either Boris Johnson or frankly any British Prime Minister could do to prevent that, is there? Mm. I wouldn't expect Boris Johnson to necessarily prevent an invasion in, in, from Russia. Um, that will save his job. <laughs> Putin is um, a notoriously dangerous politician with no respect for 
um, you know, any kind of safety or, or human rights, I don't think. Um, and if you look at the history of Russia in, in places um, like Chechnya and things like that, it's, it's pretty abhorrent. Um, the, the issue, though, I think that Alice is asking about is... It's about the pantomime, isn't it? Which is which is essentially what a lot of this is. It's a very Westminster bubble story. Um, and the people I talk to are scared about their rising fuel bills. Their fuel prices are going to be shooting up 50%. Inflation's passing 5%. That's the headline. But the cheapest pasta, I was looking at some, some figures earlier today, was 29p a kilo a year ago, and it's now 70p a kilo. That's 141%. So for the, the most vulnerable people, these are the things that we need fixing. Um, and the sooner this gets sorted out, the better. Um, I, um, I, do, I do think, actually, every day he, he holds on, it's another seat that goes to the Labour Party at the next general election. <laughs> so I think it's in the Tories' own interest to get rid of him. And I'm not sure why they're taking so long. Well, if he hangs on for 300 days, you've got basically all the seats in the House of Commons by that logic. Uh, Jackie Doyle Price, um, Ellie May on Twitter says, if you all shut up about parties, then Boris could get on with his job. <laughs> well, uh, that would be fair if there wasn't anything to talk about, wouldn't it? But, but there is a real point here, which is, while ever our politics is a soap opera, the public become more and more disengaged. And yeah, one of the reasons why... Uh, the political establishment lost the Brexit referendum is because people thought that too too much time was spent on issues that weren't really reflecting them. And, you know, as James says, actually, they are bothered about whether they're going to be able to pay the fuel bill. And they become more and more disengaged by seeing this. And, I mean, on the issue of Putin and, and Russia, I mean, Ian, you and I are old enough to remember growing up in the 1980s when we, we genuinely lived in fear of nuclear war. And that was dealt with by mutually assured destruction. And it's almost like we've lulled ourselves into a false sense of security. We've always become too self-indulgent in the West um, about our politics, that we, we've actually allowed these uh, you know, hostile actors to become more emboldened and more confident. And I think collectively, we do need to have some decent leadership. And uh, I mean, really, that's another message that I have for the Prime Minister. You shouldn't be distracted by silly things like this when there are really important issues okay. that require our attention. And we well, talked it, about it, Ukraine, but, you know, I'm worried about Bosnia again as well. I'm worried about Moldova and that, that whole, uh, you know, eastern uh, sort of corridor uh, between Russia and the West. Is, uh, there's, there's all kinds of things going on that we should be worrying about. Um, Naomi, a quick 30-second answer from you on this. Belinda tweets, listening to your show right now, what does this new phrase, soft power, mean? Hmm. Oh, uh, very good question. Um, I don't know that it is a new phrase, but um, if, you, if you like, you know, hard power is about military intervention. It's about, um, you know, literally having boots on the ground and, and, and tanks and steel. And soft power is about your diplomacy. It's about your ability to persuade your influence over others to do the right thing um, and, 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 and basically your diplomatic efforts. And, you know, we've even had a former uh, MI5 chief saying that, you know, we're really losing swathes of our soft power as a country and that's not what any of us want for Britain that's not okay. what global Britain should mean yep. right our final call up by the way we have a great fun text for you all at the end you're going to love this one I can assure you um, but first of all David in Hemel Hempstead I'm sure you're going to love his question too hi David uh, hi and hi to the panel um, the, the question I'd like to ask is is this realistically a time where Labour could start to position themselves to really start challenging the Conservative government. And the reason why I say that is I, I don't proclaim to understand politics in, in a massive way, but I've always voted Conservative. But I feel like now, for the first time in a long time, I can believe in a shadow cabinet. I, Angela Rayner, whether you agree or disagree in her conduct at times, she's a character, you can buy, buy into her. Wesley Street is phenomenal. I mean, irrespective of the position the party might be in, I mean, you look at the state of the Conservatives of Boris right now, Roll Wesley Street out in front of the media, and he's going to do you a good job. And I just, I, I'm, I'm starting to feel like they are positioning themselves very okay. well to make a credible challenge. And I just want to hear the thoughts of of the panel and yourself, Ian. Right, thirty seconds each, if we can. Um, Jamie, I'm imagining you're going to agree with the caller. Elections, believe it or not, are won or lost on economic competence, and that's what the Labour Party nearly, really need to double down on. Um, this, it's a bit of a myth 
that they've done well. You know, we had the party conference time, uh, David was talking about, um, fuel shortages, people were queuing. We've had food shortages on the shelves, inflation's going to, to a 30 year high, two and a half million people using food banks. Um, the Labour Party need to be saying, this is how we're going to create the jobs. This is how we're going to build the homes. This is what we're going to do on tax. And really, this is the time. Because then what David's right about is that moments come along when people suddenly look at politics in the way that they haven't in a long time. And they sort of come along once every 10 or 20 years. And I think this is such a moment. OK, Jackie? Well, I think what we need is a Conservative government and then we'll inspire Conservatives to vote for us. Uh, and it's that simple. Um, I, to be honest, you know, the pandemic has led to the marching creep of the state into everything. We've seen a government take very coercive powers without any real demonstration of real outcomes. And that's just got to stop. Bring back Conservatism and then we'll win again. But just remind me who's been in power since 2010. Well, as I say, I mean, that, that the pandemic <laughs> has, has encouraged bad, unconservative behaviour by this government, and that's what I'm not happy about. OK, no, Naomi. Well, I'm delighted to hear Jackie say she's concerned about the power grabs because various pieces of legislation from the policing bill to the elections bill to the orders bill are all major, major authoritarian moves from this Conservative government. Uh, what do Labour need to do to win? I think the current shadow cabinet looks more like a government in waiting than we've seen from a Labour front bench for a long time. Um, but the maths are what the maths are under our first past the post system. It is a big uphill climb for them. This is not 1997. The landscape's very very different um, and so I think they really need to be talking to the Liberal Democrats and the okay. Greens uh, in the way that, that UKIP and Brexit Party did with the Conservatives. Maya Tusi. I'll be quick. Yeah, this yeah, this one is easy. So unfortunately, it's not gonna it's not a serious shadow cabinet because every time the, the Labour Party goes up in the polls and Starmer opens his mouth and wakes up something goes wrong today this defection should have destroyed the tories it ended up unifying the tories and backfired on the labor party and the defector himself so the problem is also political competence and starmer is just a bit vanilla well that's one way of putting it i suppose right our fun text for the end lou in bristol says are you ready for this matt hancock has been photographed going into the serpentine hot <laughs> or not <laughs> oh, jackie no. <laughs> um, not my type. <laughs> I'm not going to say any more than that. He used to be my boss at the Department of Health, so I'm going to. Please... I thought she was going to say well, he you used to be my type. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say you had a narrow escape, um, <laughs> Naomi Smith. Uh, I don't believe in objectifying people for their bodies. Oh, I don't go on, just one. However, good on him. It's good for mental health. It's good for physical health. I hope he enjoyed himself. He looked like he did. Maya Tusi. I fundamentally generally don't like wet Tories. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Jamie, Jamie. Well, I can't stop that, but uh, yeah, Matt, Hon Matt Hancock's not my cup of tea. So. <laughs> OK, C can I just make clear, not mine either. Uh, thank you very much indeed to you all. Uh, Jackie Doyle-Price, Jamie Driscoll, Naomi Smith and Maya TC. Oh, it's been a great hour. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to be talking more about Boris Johnson's uh, troubles and travails in just a moment, getting more of your viewpoints. 0345 6060 973. One thing I have noticed over the past 48 hours is the number of people who are texting, tweeting and indeed calling in Defending Boris Johnson is rather more than it was this time last week. What should we read into that? It's two minutes past nine. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock. A former cabinet minister has joined calls for Boris Johnson to resign. David Davis accused the Prime Minister of failing...